introduction. Okay, my, I'm going to introduce myself. Uh, my name is Tiana Tran, and um, uh, for those that haven't met with me before, I'm the co-founder of Gov Reports. Uh, and if you haven't used Gov Reports, it's a cloud-based SBR-enabled software application operating since 2010, with uh, complete access to business reporting, tax return modules. Um, along with inbuilt services like practice manager, accountant's ledger, digital signature, etc. My professional background before coming to Gov Reports, um, I was a certified financial planner for over 13 years, uh, but I have not been practicing financial planning since then, and for that reason I will not be presenting today's uh, sessions, but instead Peter will, um, <laughs> thank God. So before we start, I want to go through a few housekeeping items. I know that pe most people did not hear me before, um, but I, I hope it's it's all good and, uh, and for now. Okay, if you can't hear me, um, please let me know. Just send me a chat message again, like I said earlier. Um, and secondly, when the presenter or myself speak, during the sessions, everyone else will be muted. Um, uh, just, this is just to ensure that uh, the background noise will not be, uh, be disturbing the others online. Um, thirdly, we do, uh, we, we, you went through the poll that, um, um, thank you, um, so we, we have the poll results and um, Peter, we, we might have to go through that later as, as, um, as you, uh, when you speak. So sure. I, I want, <laughs> I'm not too sure whether I want to introduce Peter again. Um, Peter, no need to introduce. He is, he is um, uh, you know, the SMS expert. He also the founder, um, the industry SMS industry leader, charter accountant with significant um, uh, experience both as a practitioner and a practice owner. Peter is also um, the instructor, a highly respected SMS instructor for CPA Australia, and uh, and the a keynote presenter on SMSF um, as well. I met with Peter at the CPA Congress uh, conference a couple of years ago, um, and we are. Fe I'm very honoured to have Peter walking us through uh, the, the 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 changes or the the, the new uh, implic uh, the new laws that has just come in for, since July. So Peter, I will pass it back to you now. <laughs> Okay, thanks Tiana, and I feel a bit funny because Sorry, I'm Robert. saying this for the second time, but that's just the way <laughs> webinars are. I'm still, like, I, I know a lot about SMSFs, but I know very little about presenting over a computer. I'd still, I'd still say 95% of the presentations I give are in person, and so, yeah, I'm still like, I still prefer that. Um, as uh, I did say before, for those that missed it, um, I have about 50 accountants that are giving advice under my license, under the new limited arrangements, uh, and we have been doing that since the first of July last year and so I have a lot of experience and I also teach all these guys as to what they can and can't do. In the poll we worked out that 50% of people here um, are just observers so I guess you just want some information, that's, that's fantastic. Some people have their own license, some people don't intend getting their own license but they uh, wish to still give advice to SMSFs. So, that a lot of today's focus will be on where the line is. So for those people uh, that aren't intending getting their license, we're going to take you through exactly um, what you can give, what information and advice you can give under common scenarios going forward. Uh, for those well, there wasn't really anyone that was actually saying they were going to get their license, but I'll still cover the training you need to do it in case someone changes their mind. Costing it, I don't have an answer to that, but we'll discuss it. The paperwork, this is important for those of you that have your own license, because what I've found with most accountants that have got their own license, and there's well over a thousand of them, they did, they went and did the, the course, did it as quickly as possible, and just like when we went to uni, data dumped it at the end, but now someone's going to sit down in front of them and go, how do I do this? Um, the processes for advising existing funds. So here you're not advising someone to set up an SMSF, but you may wish to give them advice, which is financial product advice. So I want to tell them that somebody that's got $1.8 million in pension, you want to advise them what they should do with their pension before the 30th of June next year. That is financial product advice. That requires a statement of advice. What do you do for those funds? Uh, for those people that are currently studying and are trying to get through their qualification and then become advisors, what sort of solutions do we have there for you? So something that is important to everybody. Now I know there are people that are saying they're observers, but if you're, um, 
if you're here on the invite of Gov Reports, chances are you've got something to do with accounting and tax. I actually use the Gov Reports product, so I, I think it's unbelievably great. So I've been a fan of it for some time now, which is how come I know Tiana. But you're, you're all interested in this sort of stuff. And prior to 2013, accountants were allowed to advise a client to establish or wind up an SMSF in the ordinary course of providing accounting services to that client. So if I was an accountant and someone come through my door, sat down in front of me and said, I want you to give me advice about setting up an SMSF, prior to 2013, I wasn't allowed to do it. Interestingly, what no one realized, but was also the case, if one of my clients sat down with me prior to 2013, or prior to 2016, or no, 13, and said, how much should I put in super this year? Again, I wasn't allowed to tell them. And no accountant was allowed to tell them that because the accountant's exemption did not extend to contributions or pensions advice. ASIC in a report in 2012, so before the law came out, noted that most exempt advisors, and that's what they call this, exempt advisors, were giving advice around uh, SMSF uh, contributions or super contributions around pensions and also around establishments without following the requirements of the corporation's law. They said that most were doing it. They knew that. And then they, but they said that they will take no further action at this time. Instead, they changed the law. So now's when they're going to start taking action. And what sort of action are they taking? And some of you may have already experienced this. The tax office are now calling trustees of new SMSFs and saying, why did you set this fund up? And if they go, well, I spoke to my accountant, they will then say, can we have a look at your SOA? So they, they fully understand there's no way any accountant in the country is going to fall for a shadow shopper. Someone rings the accountant and says, oh, I'm interested in setting up an SMSF. And they don't know the person. They're just going to say, well, sorry, mate, I can't do that. No problem whatsoever. However, an existing client they've been doing an I return for these people or they're a business client been doing their, 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 their tax work for 10 years and suddenly they think it's a good idea for them to put their business premises in a super fund or, or they think it's high tide for these people to, to gear into a property and so they establish the fund and they say to their client oh look if, I, if uh, you've got to get advice to do this um, but that's going to cost you an extra two grand or you can sign this no advice letter and the client goes, yeah, okay, I'll sign the no advice letter. And then the tax office talks to them and says, why did you set it up? And they go, well, I was talking to my accountant and um, I did all this, but he said, you know, I, I didn't want to get advice, so I signed a no advice letter. That's how they're going to catch people out that aren't doing the right thing. So it's good that you've all come on today to try and understand what you can do. When I say, I don't necessarily mean it's the right or the wrong thing from a moral point of view. I should say the legal thing, because I'm not necessarily a fan of these reforms, but the reforms are what the reforms are, and we have to put up with it. So whilst we all understand that if a client comes to us and says, should I buy BHP shares, we know that no you shouldn't do that, uh, you can't give that advice. We know that one, I don't need to cover that that's beyond the license in line today. Client comes in and says, I need life insurance, what policy should I buy? You know that you would have to refer them to a financial planner. So I'm limiting this stuff about the limited licensing line to do with SMSFs. And primarily what I'm gonna look at is um, when you're giving tax advice, uh, crossing the line with pensions advice, crossing the line with contributions advice, crossing the line with setup advice. And if there's questions on LRBAs, I haven't got a slide, I don't think, on LRBAs, but we can talk about LRBAs as well. So an example of what you can and can't do. So let's just, to, to try and explain it, Michael is a client of yours, and he just comes in, he could have any sort of a business. Let's say that Michael is um, a financial planner and he comes to you at the end of the year for some tax planning and it's it's May. So you know, there's some people in here that would know a lot more about tax planning than me but you start saying to Michael, um, I've done your, your I've, I've done some interim accounts Michael and, and your profit's going to be in excess of 250,000 which is a really good year you're going to have a big tax bill and it's May and so Michael says well what can I do to reduce my tax and you go well 
you know, we don't want to do stupid things, we don't want to spend two dollars to save a dollar, but there's other things you can do, we, we can maybe defer tax or you might earn as much next year. So the sort of things you can do, Michael, would be you've got this $20,000 um, investment allowance at the moment where you can go and spend $20,000 on plant and equipment for your business and you can get a full tax deduction for that $20,000 investment. So if you're thinking of buying new computers, um, uh, a photocopier or something like that, then you can get a tax deduction for that. Uh, then you might go on and say, um, Michael, you bill your clients, right? Well, I would suggest that there's no more billings between now and the 30th of June. You're on a cash basis, or even if you're on an accrual basis, don't bill anyone between now and the 30th of June, because then if you bill them on the 1st of July, you're deferring that income to next year. And I work very closely with a barrister by the name of Dennis Barlin, and I know when I'm getting advice from Dennis, I never get a bill after the 1st of May. I've never in my life received a bill after the 1st of May, before the 1st of July from Dennis. That's just the way he works. So that's, that's something else that you could do. You could tell him to prepay some expenses so that he might be able to prepay some interest, prepay some rent or something like that. And he can also contribute to super. So what we're doing here with Michael is that we are saying, Michael, these are all the things you can do to reduce tax. Uh, one of them includes contributing to super. Uh, but if you want advice on how much to contribute to super, I can't give you that, or if you're licensed, you can, or if, I, if you do want that advice from me, uh, I need to do it in writing in the form of a statement of advice because the corporation's law states that all financial product advice must be in writing in the form of a statement of advice. So that's basically the answer um, to what you can do if you're not a... Um, if you're not a licensed advisor. So you can give him as part of the overall tax plan uh, that he can contribute to super. Now, if he goes a bit further and says, um, well, how much can I put into super? So, so I, I haven't actually got that question on the slide. Uh, so you've said you can put money into super. Now, I know I said he's a financial planner, he should know, but you just never know. Uh, let's say he's a barrister. Um, and he says to you, well, how much can I put into super? You can answer that question because that is just a statement of fact. How old are you, Michael? I'm 32 years old. Okay, this year you can put up to $30,000 in super. That's the maximum you can contribute to get a tax deduction. You can contribute money without getting a ta tax deduction and you could go through the 540, 180, whatever uh, the contribution uh, rules are for next year. Now that's factual information, there's no problem with that. This is how much you can put into super. But then uh, he says, well how much should I put into super? That, the answer then, how much should I put in, requires you to be an AFSL holder or an authorised representative of an AFSL holder. It can be a limited licence, uh, but to give that number of yes, you should put 30000 in, or I think you should put $24,250 in, whatever it is, um, that requires you to have an AFSL. Interestingly then, it goes further. Uh, if he then says, well, I've curr I'm currently using CBUS, um, should I still contribute that money to CBUS? Now, this is actually product advice other than an SMSF, and the new limited license does not allow you as an accountant to give specific product advice other than for an SMSF or an existing superannuation holding for the client for the purpose of rolling that into an SMSF. So we're not talking about rolling it into an SMSF. He's just asking us whether or not CBUS is still the appropriate investment, uh, and your answer to that would have to be, if you've got a limited license, I can't tell you, uh, or if I've got a full license, yes, I can tell you that it either is still appropriate or it isn't. If, however, he says to you, oh, CBUS is uh, my favourite uh, super fund, but I'm currently in the cash option, should I still be in the cash option? Uh, once again, what an accountant without a license can do is they could give them general information along the lines of, Normally someone um, your age would go into growth assets, not defensive assets, if he's 32 years old. You can give general asset allocation advice as an accountant. 
if you want to say you should go into this option, then you would need to be um, a limited license holder because you're not telling him whether or not to stay with CBUS or whether to move to another fund, but you're telling him he should choose the growth option, the cash option or whatever. If there are options that were specific products within super, then no. <clears throat> so in other words, there was one that was the BlackRock International Fund, you couldn't tell them to go into that because that's choosing a, a product. So that's basically what you can and can't do. For those of you that are accountants that are, are, are not going to get licensed, it's limited to tax advice. And you should also give them a warning once you talk about super that you're not licensed to give them advice as to how much or where to put it. Um, you can only give them information about how much they can put in. So that's basically it in a nutshell uh, for contributing. How much can I contribute to super? Now that has not changed, believe it or not. None of that information I just gave you changed from the 1st of July 2013. That was actually the law prior to that, but ASIC stated that they weren't interested in do, uh, doing anything about it until now. Peter, I just, yeah. uh, personally I have a question, so I mean coming from a financial planning background point of view, it, yeah. it, that, that line where between the tax and the financial planning can be very great. I mean, it's you're talking about you know a client that asks you how much can I contribute. I mean, I can just refer to a tax the ATO website, and this is the maximum that you can contribute. And yeah. it's it has the tax implications on the client situation. So where you know like how can we? I mean, if I if I am as a tax practitioner, how can I protect myself or as a financial planner for okay. that? Well, as a financial planner, it doesn't matter um, yeah. unless you're not a registered tax agent as well, then you can't talk about the tax consequences. But as an accountant, yes, because it's not, it's not what you give, it's how the client receives it. So if the client thinks by you saying, and, and it is a very, very grey line, I, I do admit that, it's extremely grey. Let's say a client comes in and sits down and you just open the conversation with, did you know you can put 30 grand into super this year? And that's it. Now that, that may not be from you advice, but the client reads it as the only thing you've told me is to put money in super. They walk away thinking you've told them to put money in super. Now mm. that, that's probably very low risk because the tax office isn't going to ring them, ASIC's not going to ring them, uh, and how they going, where's it going to go wrong? Because most likely you're telling this person to do that because they're an extremely high income earner or they own their own house or something like that. So the risk is quite low, but the risk is there. The, and, but in terms of, yes, what do you do? You can give the tax consequences. Like if you put 30 grand in, it's going to reduce your tax by this much, um, and, but that money goes into super, it'll be taxed at 15%. That's fine, that's, that's the numbers, but you must give them the warning to state, I can't advise you how much to put in. Now if you physically state that to them, then it's more obvious to the client that you're not telling them how much to put in. But if you don't mention anything to the client, then they might think, well, you've just told me to put 30 grand in. Because I've asked you how much can I put in, you've said up to 30 grand, and then we've walked away. Instead of, you can put up to $30,000 in, but I am not allowed by law to tell you the amount you should put into super. You need to speak to a licensed financial advisor to do that. Now it sounds crap, I know, and I'm telling you this, and you're all thinking, yeah, this is bullshit, and whatever, I'm going to run away and do what I want to do. I'm just giving you what the law is, uh, and that's what the law requires, and it has required it for a long time. Accountants have been doing this for a long time against what the law says, and no one's ever taken any action, but who knows what's going to happen in the future. So that's, that's it for contributions. Now contributions advice you would think is the most simple thing, that's, but that's what the law is on contributions. Now the next one is on pensions. Now this one here, uh, even with my advisors, I say to them, I can't imagine you're ever advising a client to start a pension for financial planning reasons. I don't think any accountant sits down in front of a client that's just turned, we used to say 60, we'll now say 65, that's why I've used 65 in the um, example because Tris's are, are changing next year. So they come in, they've just turned 65, they've got 500 grand in super, she's going to keep working. 
She does not need any income from her super fund. However, she's going to keep working. She can take her minimum 5% at age 65. She can recontribute it as a non-concessional if she's still working. It makes absolute perfect sense if you are, from a tax point of view, for her to commence a pension, start a pension, and if she doesn't want the money, to recontribute that money. So it makes it, it's a good idea from a tax point of view only. Now, so most of you will stop there and go, but I can't recommend that you start the pension, and if you do start the pension, I certainly can't recommend that you recontribute the money back into super as a non-concessional. So you, you can't give them that advice, but you can tell them that from a tax point of view, if you were to start your super fund, your $500,000 super fund, it earned 5% last year, so it earned $25,000. Of that $25,000, you paid $3,250 in tax. That's what you paid, $3,250. If you were in pension phase, then your super fund, in theory, will still earn 5% because you're not going to change your investments. So it will still earn $25,000, but it will pay no tax. But the rule is you have to pull 5% of that out. So you've actually got to withdraw $25,000 as a pension but if you do that, you will save $3,250 in tax. Now that would convince most people, I believe, that it's a good idea to do it. But again, you need to state that I can't tell you whether or not to start it, and I can't tell you what to do with the money once you've drawn it out. Um, now in terms of a full licence, uh, it would only again be, well, should I start the pension in my fund? I guess some super funds actually don't allow for pensions. Some employer funds, they go, um, if you're going to start a pension, we don't have one. You've got to roll over to a pension fund. So then there would be some question that would require a full financial planner um, because it would be a case of, well, yes, I think you should start a pension. She comes back to you and says, well, they said I can't. I've got to leave. Where do I go? That, but that's rare. There's not many of them. Um, but certainly that's a, a question that needs to be answered by a financial planner. You may get other people come to you, and this is fairly rare, but I, I had a, a policeman come to me recently, and he was thinking that he needed to do something like go and set up a, an SMSF, borrow to buy property um, because of he needs more money. Now, this policeman was in a defined benefit fund with the government. He was in his 40s, and he just didn't know how to understand how to read his member statement. His member statement said the anticipated benefit at age 58 is $1,052,000. Now, when I said to him, um, you realise that doing nothing, you're going to end up with $1,052,000. And he went, oh, really? And I go, yeah, here it is here. See this, this section here? This is what that means. Now, I could do that as an accountant without being a financial planner because I'm just giving him information. Uh, th what you've got to be careful of there, though, is I was giving him that information realistically because I'd made a decision. This guy did not need to set up an SMSF and did not need to roll his money over and did not need it. So I was already giving that impression to him. Now, hey, I'm an AFSL holder so I'm, and, and I've done an SOA, so everything's good. But you could, you've got to be careful. if. If you were an accountant and you looked at it and you thought, this guy doesn't need to do anything, he's fine, you've actually made an opinion regarding his superannuation, uh, which may lead to him thinking you've given advice. So again, what I would need to say to my mate, and I actually didn't do an SOA because I didn't charge him, and if you don't charge, you don't have to do one, which is good. But what I would need to do if he was a client and I was advising him, I'd go, you know, that's the information I've given you, however, I'm not allowed legally to advise on this sort of stuff. So I really need to recommend that you go and speak to a financial planner. By adding that disclaimer and making it quite clear, you're actually not then breaching the law, uh, unless again, you've still done it in a way like, mate, this you've got a million bucks here, that's more than enough for you. Uh, by the way, I'm not allowed to tell you that, so I've got to recommend to you that you go and seek financial advice. So you understand that, don't you? And he goes, yeah. He's walked away thinking you've advised him to do it. So we all understand that a judge wouldn't um, 
uh, wouldn't accept that you haven't given advice no matter how much paperwork you had. Paperwork's good, documentation of not giving advice is good, but it only works if you actually don't give the advice. So you just got to be careful of that. Uh, okay, so now this is the classic one. This is the one where uh, you will get caught. If you, do, if you cross the line here, this is the one that they're looking for and it's the one where, where you will get caught. And I just read something in the media yesterday, ASIC are now going out to talk to accountants about what they're doing. I don't know how they're doing it, and maybe it's, it's legislation by announcement. It's like when they say, we're cracking down on uh, school teachers this year. So all the school teachers don't make any uh, claims for deductions, and they achieve their aim just by announcing it. So it, it could be something similar to that, we don't know. Uh, and I, uh, you know, they might just be going to licensed accountants, we don't know. But anyway, Peter and Jane come in and ask you to tell them about SMSFs as they're thinking of setting one up. All they want is information. So quite often what would happen is Peter and Jane went to the Gold Coast on the weekend, someone offered them a, f a free fry pan if they went to a seminar. So they accepted the fry pan and they went to a seminar and the seminar said how wonderful it was to set up an SMSF, uh, borrow to gear your SMSF up and then you'll have way more money um, in retirement by, by doing that. So they think it's fantastic but uh, all your clients are like this and you know, when you talk to these property brokers, you learn very quickly that Anyone that's got an accountant, they can never get to them because they always say, oh, I need to speak to my accountant first. Mind you, they do quite often get them. I, I also hear those stories. But yeah, so they come to you and they just go, no, no, we, we, we just want advice. So what you can do there as an accountant is you can certainly give them the ATO publications. That's what we said. And tell them to go and look at ASIC stuff. You can tell them that Okay, to set up an SMSF, you've got to decide whether you want a corporate trustee or individual trustees. And they go, oh, what do you mean by that? Oh, well, you can set up a company um, or you can have individuals. Oh, what's the difference? Um, well, the difference is one's a corporate trustee. Yeah, but what does it mean to us? The minute you say what it means to them, you might be giving them advice as to what structure to set up. So you've got to be careful about that one. But you can give them the ATO publication. You can tell them to fill out an application form. You can say that my fee to establish an SMSF, including a corporate trustee, if you decide you want one, is $1,650. You just need to give me all this information. Uh, we can set it up. And then if you've decided you want to roll over your other super funds, then we can help you contact the other super funds to get your money. Uh, but of course, I can't advise you whether or not to set up an SMSF. And um, so I can't advise you to do it and I need to recommend that you go and speak to a financial planner. And that's what Peter, you can do. On, Peter, yeah. on that note, so if you, they, they, you know, you're talking about the, you know, uh, the corporate trustee and the, the um, uh, personal, you know, as a personal trustee. Yeah. Is that really for financial planner to explain the structure, the, uh, the, the tax structure? Uh, it's not the tax structure, that's the structure of the SMSF. And the problem we've got yeah. is that it's superannuation. So if someone comes to you and says, should I be in this option or that option? Should I be in this fund or that fund within the fund? Because you're talking about their superannuation and you're giving advice, you're actually giving advice. You can give compliance advice, but it's not compliance advice really to decide whether it's a corporate trustee or individual trustees, unless what you want to say to them, you could say to them things like, um, well, a corporate trustee costs more money, but it means that uh, if you change members, you don't have to change ownership of the assets um, and, and go like that. The very interesting thing is that only 50% of self-managed super funds state that they use an accountant uh, for their SMSF, and the other 50% just go direct to administrators. Um, now. Uh, the ATO claim that 85% of funds have individual trustees. Now I established 3% of Australia's SMSFs and 80% of mine have corporate trustees and they all come from accountants. Um, and I do them for a, a lot of firms and I've got other people I know that also do them for accounting firms and most of them are setting them up with corporates. So it seems to be that the accountants are actually advising them to go to corporates but without advice most of them will go individuals. So. You know, you, you've basically got to let them make that decision themselves. But give them information. But that information is best coming from the ATO publications and refer them to the part of the ATO publication that says decide between a corporate and an individual and, and let them go. Also, uh, 
what I would suggest is that if a client comes down, sits down in front of you, and say they're a miner, they're on 300 grand a year, um, you know they've got 120 grand in super, and they're an absolute smacker of a candidate to do an SMSF and a borrowing, and then you just put in front of them, hey, here's some stuff about SMSFs, you should have a read. Uh, I can't advise about them, but you might be interested. Now that proactive approach, which we always tell accountants to do, may have you crossing the line if the client walks away thinking, Peter's just suggested an SMSF to me, I better learn about them. Now go and do all their research, come back and go, yeah, it's a great idea, Pete, let's do it, what do I have to do? And he sets it up on the instructions from the client, says, I can't give you any advice. And the client's thinking, yeah, I know, of course, you, you're saving me two grand. So you've got to be careful about that proactive approach to going to the clients and setting up their SMSF for them. Now I'm conscious of the time, so I'll move on. So all the golden rules, <laughs> and we'll sort of get this out of what we've just done then. Uh, so advice Peter, that, sorry, Tiana, yep. Yeah, just have a very quick question. For for yeah. bookkeepers, manager who manage um, uh, accounts or you know like transactions and, and business uh, related uh, information for for clients and including their same in a super fund transactions. Yeah. Um, yeah. Is there possibilities that of any, you know, like when when uh, you know, advance agents would say, oh, well, here you go, the ATO's um, website relating to the contributions. Is is I, there I some way? Yeah, you, you, yeah. But, uh, I mean, there's no reason why a bookkeeper can't tell them what the contributions are. That that's fine. If if that's what if if the person asks their bookkeeper, how much can I contribute? Yep, this is the amount. Um, but the minute they say, well, what do you reckon? They've, they've just got to say, well, no. Because, you know, yeah, I've, I've, I use a bookkeeper in my own business and, and she's brilliant. And so she'll come in and, and we'll talk about how much profit I've made. And I might say to her, well, now I don't need to say, but I, I, her other clients would say, well, you know, super sounds like a good idea. I put money in super last year, I put money in super the year before. You know, you've seen my accounts, how much do you think I should put in this year? And that 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 is crossing the line, absolutely, because you can't give that. But, there's lots of questions you would need to ask there. Um, first of all, do they have a mortgage? Um, should they be paying off their mortgage rather than contributing to super? Uh, are they thinking, have they got a daughter's wedding come up, coming up? Have they got um, you know, big expenses or whatever in the future? Are they thinking of moving overseas, in which case the super is going to be useless to them? There's lots of other questions that need to be asked before you advise someone how much to put into super. Now we give our advisors um, some no-brainer situations. We go, if they've got more than a million dollars worth of assets uh, in their own name, uh, combined for the family, uh, outside of super, we don't have a problem with you advising them to contribute up to the maximum. If they've got an income um, of 150 grand or more, we don't mind you advising them to contribute the maximum. If they have, uh, surplus income of $50,000 or more, we don't mind you advising them to contribute up to the maximum. So we have rules that we give our advisors. Now our advisors are authorised to do it, but we don't need to check their advice is what I'm saying. Um, in other circumstances we want to check all their advice, but under those circumstances we let them go through. Uh, and so, but as a bookkeeper, yeah, the minute they ask for your opinion, you can't give that opinion. Now, clients always say, what would you do? The minute you say what you would do, you're giving them advice. We all know that. So, yeah. So answer their questions. How much can I put into super this year? Don't go to them and say, you got 200 grand in profit, you should speak to someone about super. Don't do that if you're not licensed. Because that's a proactive response that's suggesting they should put money into super. Um, now I'm saying use disclaimers on the golden rules, as in, client wants you to set up an SMSF. The CA, CPA, IPA have put out publications which have disclaimers in it to state that I haven't given you advice. Now as I said, if you do give advice, that won't help you, but at least you've got it. Uh, and be reactive, not proactive. Uh, I won't go too much on the advice process. Um, and we all understand that the advice process is the first thing you have to do to a client is give them a financial services guide. You must uh, comply with the safe harbour provisions and collect all information for the client and that's usually done by using your licensees um, 
client questionnaire. Those that are self-licensed may not have one, so my details are at the end. Contact me, we can help you out with that. Uh, in terms of uh, ensuring advi appropriate advice and best interest, that's how that comes about. You must consider alternatives in your SOA. Don't just say, I think you should set up an SMSF. You need to say an alternative is to not have an SMSF, but hopefully your client said, I want to buy property in super. You go, well, I suggest you set up an SMSF. An alternative is to not have an SMSF, but then you can't have property. Also then, you don't have to worry about costs. You must compare the costs of the current fund with, any, um, uh, with an SMSF. We talked about the financial services guide. You must give them a statement of advice. And then in the future, you can give what's called a record of advice that doesn't have the same uh, rules as a statement of advice, provided the advice relates back to that statement of advice. And what we say to our advisors is, give a statement of advice this year. We recommend you set up an SMSF. We recommend you contribute each year up to the maximum deductible contribution amount or concessional contribution amount. Uh, and we will confirm that amount with you each year. Uh, and if you're if they're in if they're in their fifties when we talk to them, we'll go. And upon reaching um, end of work life or age sixty five, whichever comes first, we will then discuss starting a pension. So what that means is next year when you want to talk to them about the amount they contribute to super, it's to a record of advice. It's basically an email stating that you know this is the advice. We have to disclose any fees to that record of advice, but most accountants won't charge extra for that record of advice conscious of the time, I guess we did start a bit late. Uh, in terms of training and where you can get your training, uh, that, I don't think there's anyone that's on their way through this. So in terms of getting the initial training, if you're a CA or a CPA or an IPA um, public practice holder, you can go to Kaplan, you can get a single subject accountants uh, exemption uh, license qualification for five hundred odd dollars. Uh, IPA members, it's an extra hundred. You've got to do another uh, challenge exam, but it's around five hundred dollars. It's thirty hours work. You are then uh, qualified to become an authorised rep of a limited AFSL holder, or you can go right through to getting a full diploma of um, financial planning. Kaplan do that. CPA do that. Uh, CPA require you to do three subjects to get that diploma. So it's obviously a lot more work and it costs you about two grand. There's a million other diploma providers. You've just got to look it up, talk to them and say, will this qualify? Or get it in writing that it will qualify uh, you to become an uh, authorised rep. Now for those of you that have your licence, RG146 not only talks about the initial training requirements, it talks about ongoing training requirements. Now you might think that you can just do your annual um, CPD per, with the NTAA, CA, CPA, whatever, and that will qualify you. But you need, uh, RJ146 requires you to do training in all areas uh, covered under your licence. So if you've got a limited licence that only allows you to do superannuation SMSFs and general financial planning, then yet you, a lot of your training on SMSFs and super will cover it, but your general financial planning training is not covered by any of the accounting bodies. I know that, I do the training for CPA. So <coughs> you would need to find, yes, Tiana? So Peter, you know, because there's different levels of license, so the limited mm -hmm. license and the full license, in terms mm -hmm. of CPD, the, the RG146, is that mm -hmm. the same for everyone? You said that, you know, if, if you know you qualify for the SMSF, then you only need to do yep. that, but you still need the, fin the other fin full financial planning because, you know, in terms of fact finding and so forth, yes. you still need to Correct. go through you that. Need the general, you need the general financial planning training, so that's different stuff. For example, you must do training on the economic environment. Now, we don't have ec economists come and present to us on the current economic environment. We don't uh, talk about just straight retirement planning calculations and things like that. Now, if your limited license extends to life insurance, then you need training ongoing on life insurance. If it extends to managed funds, uh, managed investments and securities, like my limited license does, then we need to do ongoing training in those. Now, we do an annual CPD conference. Um, I'm just giving myself a bit of a plug. It's in Bali on the 6th and 7th of July this year. And it will cover all of the RG146 topics that a limited license holder needs. Uh, it probably wouldn't give enough training 
for the responsible manager. We require 20 hours. I'm only giving 13 hours of training here, but it will certainly cover you if you're an authorised rep. And I know that for my authorised reps, attendance at, at that conference is 100% of the annual requirement for CPD, and it's also uh, CPD covered for CA, CPA, and IPA because it's it's again public accounting services. Uh, in terms of costing your advice, I don't have an answer to that because I see within my advisors it ranges from nothing to I have one advisor, a lady up the mountains that actually has the SMSF accounting at say 2,200 a year and on top of that $100 a month for the financial advice that goes with it and she has a number of clients paying that which is great. But I have noticed and I'm not here to tell people what to charge, but what I have noticed and what it seems to be from, from my clients is what we seem to be saying now is if a client comes to you and you're licensed, then they say to them, the cost of setting up an SMSF is $3,300. Now I divide that into two. It's $1,650 for the advice, for me to go through and give you all the advice. And if you still want to go ahead, then it's another 16.50. And they go, I don't want advice. I go, no, no, sorry, you are getting advice because I'm not having you come back to me in a year's time to say, well, why didn't you tell me that? Because I know that will happen. So you will be getting advice. Uh, if you're too scared to say that to your client, and a lot of accountants are, then just say, it's $3,300 to set up an SMSF with a corporate trustee. If you don't want a corporate trustee, I can reduce it. Um, well, if you're licensed, you're allowed to tell them to get a corporate trustee, so it won't matter. That's what I'm finding. If you're not licensed, then by all means, you can say to the client, um, it's $16.50 to set up an SMSF, and, but I recommend you go and speak to Joe Bloggs down the road, and he's going to charge you $16.50 to give you all the advice as to whether or not you should or shouldn't do it. That's just what I'm seeing. There is no hard and fast answer. Uh, now the advice paperwork, I did cover a little bit for those of you that have a license. Um, now one thing, I've, I've got it as number six, you should have a separate entity. Now it's too late for those of you that have got your own license and I've got some self-licensed accountants that have come to me and I said well, we did it in the, same, in the same entity. The problem with doing it in the same entity is that your entity is now a member of the financial ombudsman service or the credit ombudsman service. Now that means that if an iReturn client wishes to make a complaint, not only are they limited to CA, CPA, IPA, they can also go to the financial ombudsman service. Now the professional bodies are pretty good at protecting their members. The financial ombudsman service only protects the consumer. So if they want to make a complaint about your accounting fees because you charged them 10 grand and they think it was too much, now that you're a member of, member of FOS, they can go to FOS and go, this guy charged me 10 grand for my accounts, you should only have charged me five. They can make a determination that they should have only charged you five. They can do that because your accounting practice is a member of FOS. So it's, it's something to think about there. You, you, you're three years behind before you can get another license, before you can get your license again. So it'll take three years. If you're an authorised rep, we certainly suggest that you um, now set up a separate entity and go, I, plea, I want my authorised representative to be as a separate entity. The other thing is, um, is limited liability. You're all a member of a limited liability scheme. Accountants have limited liability. Financial planners don't have limited liability and we don't have a court answer yet to say whether or not if it's the same entity you still have limited liability. So we take the conservative approach and say have a separate entity so that your accounting practice doesn't lose its limited liability. But there's no doubt that if you've got a letterhead saying you've got limited liability and you're offering financial planning services, that's misleading and deceptive conduct in a way because the clients do have unlimited liability against you for financial planning services. Uh, now we talked about the financial services guide, make sure you have that, that's, that's the golden rule for, a, um, for uh, financial planning. When ASIC uh, research financial planners, when ASIC do shadow shopping, their focus is purely on compliance. They actually want to see that you comply with the law. You can give the crappiest piece of advice known to man, but provided your advice process fully complies with the law, they'll say you're a good advisor. However, 
if you give them the best advice under the sun, and, and of course all this is only known in arrears, but you give them the best advice under the sun, but you fail to give them a financial services guide, they'll fail you as an advisor because you didn't give them the FSG. Now the purpose of the FSG is to allow clients to understand who they're dealing with, because quite often you'll see a brand name, XYZ financial planning, authorised representative of whoever, and then when you dig deep, it's a wholly owned subsidiary of one of the banks or AMP. So they're a product provider. So people think they're going to an independent financial planner, they're going to a product provider. Uh, they don't get charged for the SOA, they walk in and go, how much is the advice? It's free. Well, it's not really free, and so they need to know how you get paid and all that sort of stuff. So for accountants, our FSGs are great. We say in ours, we don't receive commissions, we don't pay commissions, we'll give you uh, an engagement letter to tell you how much you're paying, you'll write us a cheque for the amount. It's actually really good for the clients. You'll need to do statements of advice, um, and provided that covers the future, then you can go to records of advice going forward. So my authorised reps, I must write all their statements of advice. So I do the statements of advice, but then each year following that, they just send an email record of advice, copy me into the record of advice, I, copy, I put that email onto the file and, and I've got the client's file. I can review the advice and, and that's all they need. Now a fee disclosure statement, again, not many of you will need that if you're limited advisors, uh, but if what happens there is if, if you're going to put your clients like the lady in the mountains, she's got to do a fee disclosure statement because she's charging $100 a month for her advice. And that's all it is, it's just it's $100 a month and each year they get an engagement letter, they re-sign for the following year and everyone knows what's happening just like with our accounting fees when it's on a monthly uh, fee. Now we say separating your files, um, you know, some people go to having different filing cabinets and which is sort of impossible these days because we're all paperless, but don't have one file that covers everything. Have your accounting as totally separate to your financial planning. Okay, we're close to the end. Um, now, just what am I doing? Uh, I had a client ring me the other day and they said, oh, we've had three funds on hold, three new, three new funds on hold because um, my husband was the, the, the wife who, who sort of is the practice manager. My husband, um, we call him Michael, it's not his name, but Michael still hasn't finished his training. And, and I said, let's call this lady Margaret. I said, Margaret, um, what you're really saying to me is you've had a client on hold who's going to dinner parties at the weekend. They're talking to their clients. They're saying, oh yeah, it's, it's SMSFs are good. And their client, and their, their client's saying, yeah, well, my accountant, I spoke to him about it in July, but he hasn't come back to me yet. The guy at the dinner party says, well, go and talk to my accountant. He'll have it done for you this week. You run the risk of losing the client because you're spinning on your, on, on your wheels and you're just doing nothing about it. Um, I know that you're going to need to become an authorised rep. You can't get your own licence now unless you've already applied for it. Uh, you need to be an authorised rep. We will actually give you 12 months to complete your training so you can come on as, authorized, as an authorised rep and you can have an SOA done within a week's time. So something to think about. But if you're in that position where you know, I'm, I can't keep putting these clients on hold, just get back to me. My contact details are at the end. And then um, finally, and this is for the people that have a licence, because I know most of my clients I would find on average uh, my advisors, I should say, would have 50 funds. I asked the question of everyone, so not the average, but the median would be 50. The average would be higher than that because we have some with 500. But the median number of funds for a client would be 50, but they would only set three or four up a year. So they, they only need three or four establishment SOAs, but these 50 clients are going to come and talk to them. There's a lot of them are going to come and talk to them this year about pensions. Um, they're going to talk to them about contributions and so you need a process because that's requi that requires an SOA now. So the, the, the way we've set it up is to do what we call a review SOA which is a very simple process. It's a two page client questionnaire which isn't a detailed questionnaire, most of it is yes no answers. Um, you know, does the fund still fulfil its needs? Are you happy with the fund? A few things like that, very simple. It'll be no more than 10 questions the client needs to ask. Get the financial statements and then we do a statement of advice that confirms that they should still be in the SMSF. They should still contribute and at some stage they will need to start a pension. 
if they're, if they're thinking of going into an, uh, an LRBA at some stage, then we might put in the review SOA that you should come and talk to us about gearing or something like that. There's no switching advice. So from a compliance point of view from ASIC, when there's no switching advice, so you're not telling them to move from one product to another. And that's really what most people complain about. You know, I go to the advisor, he says, get out of this and, and get into that one. So what th we do there is we have a very simple process for a review SOA. We've had it signed off by our lawyers and it's very simple for the accountant. You've got that SOA, then you present that to the client and then each year you can do this record of advice thing. So it makes it much simpler uh, and really simple for your clients. Now I believe we're at seven o'clock already, but what I will do is I'll just put my contact details up there. Feel free to write them down. I wrote them today. I noticed I spelt the word your wrong in one of the slides, um, but that is my contact details. So by all means, uh, write down my email, write down my mobile number and give me a call. People must have questions. I imagine some people have probably dropped yeah. off. <laughs> there, <laughs> there, there, there is a question from Alex Cremati. Um, mm -hmm. His question is, if I, as a tax practitioner, refer uh, my clients as a licensed financial, uh, to a, finan a licensed financial planner, and this financial planner has not done his job properly, and those clients have lost a large amount of, of um, uh, money in their super, would those clients could take legal actions on a tax uh, petitioner or uh, who refer them to the financial planner? So uh, that, that's a legal question. Now I am a director of Access Law Group, so, um, but I'm not a solicitor. Uh, it really is a legal question. It depends on whether, it really comes down to how negligent you were as the accountant. Um, I saw one example where someone was referred to their husband um, and the husband put them all through CFDs and, and now that was clearly a case where they could have gone the accountant uh, but the PI insurers said no and so there was very little chance of them getting anything so they didn't pursue it. But um, So there is a chance but it depends on whether that's a conflict. Are you getting a referral free from that financial planner? Um, did you warn the client or, or anything? It really comes down to the situation. If you're doing something like that for referral fees and you're not disclosing them, then you could be in trouble. But if it's just simply, this guy gives me clients, I give him clients, I really don't know what he does, um, just say that to your client. Just let your client know that, hey, I'm not a financial planner, I can't really comment on what he tells you. But I also find that most um, clients of financial planners want the accountant to review the SOA. And that, yes, that is a bit of a problem for you. Uh, if you review it, because then they may think that you've actually condoned it. And that's what you've got to be careful of, you, you, that you're condoning the advice. Uh, now obviously if they've lost a lot of money, it's because of product, uh, not because of strategy, um, unless of course going into CFDs, uh, if they've been advised to set up an SMSF and uh, put all their money into CFDs, those of you that are tax practitioners have seen anyone invest in CFDs, the, I ask the question every time I'm in a room of accountants, who's had clients invest in CFDs and a number of hands go up, I say leave your hand up if any of them have made money, not a hand has ever stayed up. So yes, they could lose money there, uh, but again, yeah, you, 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 you're not allowed to comment. Uh, I'm not allowed to comment if someone's told to put, well actually no, I could say don't invest in CFDs because that's class of products, so I'd probably be okay. Um, it's a difficult one to answer and you know, it's a legal question, not a financial question because it would be up to the judge to decide whether or not you were responsible at all for their financial loss. And no doubt you would be joined in because why not? It costs nothing for their, the solicitor they get to represent them. It costs nothing for that solicitor to join you in um, to the action. And then hopefully you've got a good solicitor that says, well, this is vex vexatious, so we will be claiming money back um, if, if you know, the court says that that was a joke. So yeah, I don't know that that's helped you. Um, it comes down to your level of responsibility. Indeed, it is very grey. Um, mm. Peter, just, just another um, a thought. I, I remember when setting up the Seminar Super Fund, I mean, 
even with the, the uh, setting it up with the accountant, I still need an investment strategy. Is that still the case? And 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 you know, if the the clients come to me and say, as a tax agent, um, yep. Um, set up the the the, um, the the similar super fund for me. I want a corporate trustee or individual trustee, yeah, yeah. you know, yeah. whatever. I just give direct instructions. Invest investment strategy is still in place, and and how you know like how. It's a really good know. question. Yeah, what what can an accountant do for an yeah. investment strategy? Great, great, great question. And I I haven't covered it, and you're right, I should have. So. An investment strategy, regulation 4.09 of the CIS regs or section 52.2F. It says that the trustees must formulate and give effect to. So you can't just formulate the strategy and have it written. You've got to give effect to it. So in other words, you've got to invest in accordance with it. That's what the law says. Um, and in, uh, an investment strategy that considers, and it get, runs through a raft of things that it needs to consider. Um, it needs to consider diversification. Now you can talk to a client about diversification, about what diversification is. You know, different assets reduce your risk. Different asset classes reduce your risk. So that's diversification. You can then, and it talks about risk and return. You can talk about risk and return. Obviously, if you, you're 65, so you probably can't take as much risk as someone that's 30. You can talk about that. It wants you to talk about cash flow. Accountants are experts at cash flow. They're better than financial planners. That's what accountants do. So you can talk to them about cash flow. You can talk to them about meeting liabilities when they're due. Again, that's what accountants do. You can talk to them about that. But then it says um, your overall asset mix. So it does talk about your overall asset mix. Now what you can't do as an accountant is tell them what their overall asset mix is to be. Now I know that no one in this room wants to do it anyway. You don't want to say to a client, I think you should have 100 grand in uh, international shares, 80 grand in Australian shares, 20 grand in property trusts, and the rest in bonds. Uh, you don't want to do that. So the client will know what they want to invest in, but you can certainly say to the client in terms of cash flow, okay, how much we go contribute each year? Oh, I'm going to put um, well, my 9% is uh, 18 grand, fine. What are the costs going to be? Well, I've only got to pay tax. Okay, well, cash flow is, is positive. This is how we'll do it. Coming up to pension time, you've got to take 40 grand a year out of the fund. How are you going to fund it? They tell you, oh, well, I'll, uh, I'll have 80 grand in the bank and I'll take it from the, from the bank account plus earnings. Good, accountants can talk about that. So that's where you can determine cash flow. Meeting liabilities, okay. So what if your wife dies? How are you going to pay her death benefit? You know, what do you mean? I go, well, you've got to pay a death benefit. What options do I have? Cash, or interim lump sum, final lump sum, or one or more pensions? What's a pension? Well, that's where you take it down slowly. Oh, well, we just leave the money in there and take a pension. So you can do all that. What you can't do is talk about their asset mix. They've got to decide the asset mix. Once they give you the asset mix, Anyone on this um, webinar can draft the investment strategy for them and give it to them and say, is that what you wanted? That's fine, because that's not financial product advice. Financial product advice is giving is deciding what the asset mix is. Wow, so is very great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Now, we have a very detailed um, process for investment strategies for people that want to do it. Uh, it's got a client questionnaire where the client, you can fill out all the financial stuff and then you give it to the client and then all they've got to do is put down what the asset mix will be and all of that then on an online app generates a, a, a compliant investment strategy. So yeah, we've got that there and you can do it. If anyone wants a demo, see me after and I can take you through it. Okay, any other questions from anyone else? It's probably all gone, Tiana. <laughs> yeah. um, we, we still have audience on the line. Uh, Peter, before we, we do wrap up the sessions, um, I understand that you um, have uh, a conference coming up. Uh, who would this be suitable for and the cost involved? And for the people that are here today, uh, certainly I can, uh, well, I can see from the poll is that, um, you know, they're not your members. Is there any special offer, et cetera? Uh, okay, so the conference is only really designed for either authorised representatives of my AFSL, and for those people it's free to attend, but you've got to get yourself to Bali and accommodate yourself over there at the Conrad um, in Bali. Uh, for people with their own licence, it's $660 to attend the conference, and optionals 
like the, the conference dinner of another 130 bucks per person if you want to come to the conference dinner, but that's optional. And again, you've got to get yourself to Bali. That will give you 13 hours of CPD. Um, so it's 10 hours of superannuation, SMSF in general, financial planning, and then an hour each of securities, managed investments and life insurance for those with the other um, authorities on theirs. For someone that's an authorised rep of another AFSL, you need to contact them because they tell you what the training requirements are. <laughs> Excuse me. And again, okay. yeah, just contact me and I can put you, I, I can let you know all that sort of stuff, what you want. Okay, it sounds pretty good and, and, and we obviously have run over time. My apology that I um, did not know how to operate the system initially, thought I have done enough to, to warrant that, but uh, no, it didn't, <laughs> didn't happen. Um, for those that have more questions, and it, like I said, uh, Peter said, you can contact him directly or let us know and uh, we'd be more than happy to attend to your questions or refer to the right persons. Uh, obviously, uh, as Gov reports, we are a software provider. We cannot provide any of these advice and hence, um, um, if it's, it's uh, SMSF related, it's probably be best to contact Peter or the SMSF expert um, uh, team. Um, th thank you, Peter, for, uh, for your insight yeah. information. Certainly, this is a, 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 an extending, and I believe it's, um, the number of SMSF now um, is almost 100%, 99.6% of the number of funds available uh, in uh, uh, register with ASIC or, or APRA. So obviously, it is increasing, ever increasing, and it's, it's um, putting the, the financial planners, not only the tax practitioners, but also the financial planner um, in a gray, very gray area when uh, dealing with SMSF clients. Um, again, thank you everyone. I'll leave it to you to turn it off, Tiana. I'll turn it off. Let me find <laughs> out. <laughs>